Is nonviolent resistance uh, able to end aggression and wars? In my mind, it's important to keep nonviolent resistance alive as a form of political experimentation, as a public statement. There's always a question for a resistance movement whether it can contain its violence in such a way that it is just organized for the purposes of bringing down that regime, after which they will all become nonviolent. <laughs> because violence has a way of getting out of control. Once violence is used, it can be replicated and used by others, and it produces a license for the use of violence. The problem, of course, is that many people suspect that nonviolence is a very weak political instrument, that it can't really do the job. But there are militant forms of nonviolence. There are aggressive forms of nonviolence. So when human beings produce a, a barrier, like a human barrier, that stops the police from being able to deport other people or to protect a strike, it's physical. It's it's an it's a human obstacle. It's a human barrier. It's strong. It's forceful. It's just not violent. What is an effective uh, resistance? Activism on social media, nonviolent protests? Well, it depends on the topic and it depends on the place. In Erdogan's Turkey, and there are many people who are political dissidents who don't feel free to come out into the street or to voice their opposition to the government's policies of censorship and expulsion. Social media is really important for them, including forms of cell phone communication that are encrypted or, you know, they still have networks of communication among themselves. They are just operating in a different way. When are certain forms of violence uh, considered to be part of an admirable struggle for freedom and when they're considered to be terrorism? The line seems to be very thin. Antonio Gramsci said that the state always considers its own violence to be justified. It calls it coercion. It's understandable when you're being attacked that you would want to defend yourself physically. The question, of course, is whether in this world, in this global world, getting international support for your cause of freedom or your cause uh, to overcome oppression isn't even more effective than trying to uh, pursue a military strategy that can only provoke and strengthen the military opposition. I find it amazing sometimes when people at war decide to lay down their guns and just allow the conflict to pause. Like, oh, okay, let's not have war. Do you agree? We won't have war for three days so these people can move out or we can open a hospital. Oh, okay, that's fine. Why can't they say five days, 10 days, 20? Why not a year? Maybe why not five years? The United States has a very uh, rich history in nonviolent resistance and the movement against the Trump regime, the nonviolent movement, is getting um, bigger in shape and uh, in frequency. Do you think this is the right way to go against this regime? Let's think of what that means. When he first proposed the so-called Muslim ban, many people went to the airports and they surrounded the airports. They made the airport dysfunctional. They, they called for a strike. These were very powerful actions, uh, and they were nonviolent. We haven't been able to stop him. You know, in the last days, he's been responsible for separating children from their parents. We need to think 
really clearly who are our allies, what are our political instruments, how can we use the law. We have to come up with our own candidates and our own plan. We can't just be opposing him. We have to be developing another future, and we have to make that future deeply desirable to the majority of people in the country.